Turn with me, if you will, to 1 Samuel chapter 30. We're going to read from verse 4 together. It says here, David and his men reached Ziklag on the third day. Now the Amalekites had raided the Negev and Ziklag. They had attacked Ziklag and burned it and had taken captive the women and all who were in it, both young and old. They killed none of them, but carried them off as they went on their way. When David and his men came to Ziklag, they found it destroyed by fire and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. So David... And his men wept aloud until they had no strength left to weep. I'd imagine the morning that David and his men returned to Ziklag, probably pretty much like every other morning. They'd been out doing their thing, they'd come back. But once they started crying, when they got back and they realised the state of affairs back at home, they started crying. And once they started crying, they wept aloud until they had no strength left to weep. As we come around God's word today, my hope is simply that through my transparency today, everyone who is feeling hopeless would receive hope and everybody that is feeling discouraged would receive some encouragement. Is there anybody who could do with some hope today? Anybody do with some encouragement today? If that's you today, then I hope and I pray that through my transparency, God might speak to you. As many of you may be aware, may not be aware, earlier last year, Georgie and I, we pretty much fell off the face of the earth. Well, enjoy church anyway. Uh, as for mid-January, thereabouts, for the first uh, half of last year, we were gone. In July 2022, we were on our way to minister in America. On the way in, we thought we'd fly into, uh, uh, into Mexico and, um, and play golf and just hang out with some friends and whatever. On my first day there, how many of you, how many of you love going on a holiday? It's like, got a few days off, let's go. And there's just such expectation. Day one, I discovered what vertigo was. Vertigo. How many of you know it's a dog of a thing? It is horrible. As in, now, just so in case you're wondering, no, there was no tequila involved. You know what I'm saying? I was in, no, 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 no. It wasn't that sort of vertigo. That's a different sort of, Pastor Mike, you know about that vertigo. I do not know about that vertigo. No, he does not know about it. Pastor Lisa knows about it. No, she does not know about it. Beck, no, we won't even go there. All right. So, so uh, no tequila involved, but this is the truth. It, 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 it's like, how many, of you know, how many of you have ever had it or know people have had it? It is terrible. Out of nowhere, I'm like, hey, man, what's happening? Then I'm throwing up in the streets. I'm throwing up in the restaurant. So I can't stand up. I'm falling over. And it's like, what is going on? In hindsight, I think what was happening was my body was telling me that I had to stop. How many of you know your body will speak to you? I don't know about you. I don't listen to too too many people. I don't listen to my body. I don't listen. I don't listen at times. But my body was telling me I had to stop, but I didn't. I simply mustered up whatever strength I had left. I I continued to preach for the next four weekends, and then I returned to Australia where I just soldiered on. After getting home, I found myself bouncing through a number of very challenging scenarios. Well, wouldn't it be good if you give your life to Jesus and then from that day on, life is just sweet, you know what I'm saying? It was just altogether, altogether good. It was beautiful, everything in its place, but that was not my reality. I, I went back into Australia, flew back into Australia. Obviously, we'd had lockdowns. This is the year after the lockdowns ended. We stepped out, went through all these challenging scenarios, personally challenging, emotionally challenging, relationally challenging. I was being challenged in ways that, to be honest, I didn't understand. I, I, I found it really hard to get my head and my heart around some of the things that were happening in my life. I was, I, I was, I was not just losing balance now uh, when it comes to the physical reality because of vertigo, but now I'm starting to lose balance on the inside. I, I don't know what is happening. I can't quite put my finger on it. I've never been here before, but this is where I found myself. So on, on, on Tuesday the 10th, Georgie and I went to see my doctor. The, the reality was we, we were planning to go to Cambodia. We've got a couple of locations in Cambodia. So our flights are booked for the 11th. All right, so we've got to go. How many of you know that there's times in your life where you can feel the pressure building? Pressure building, pressure building. I'm thinking, so for probably all through January, I'm just going to have a few days off around Christmas. I'll be fine. I'll be fine. I'll be fine. If I get to Christmas, I can breathe, and then I'll hop on the plane. Well, we went through Christmas, and nothing changed. Nothing at all changed. In fact, it was just building, 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 and then it's like, okay, Georgie, we've we got to fly out, but to be honest, babe, I don't, know that I, I, don't, I don't know that I can hop on this plane. I don't know that I've got... I, I, I don't know what's going on. I just don't feel myself. So Georgie says, all right. So I said, can we go to the doctor before 
before we fly out, absolutely. So the day before I was meant to fly, we go see our doctor, Dr. Emmanuel, Nigerian brother. I've got to tell you, I love this man. He loves us. I'm surrounded by incredible men and women of God. And so we go see our doctor. We go in. We sit, we're about to sit down. As I go to sit down in, the, in his office there, I start to cry. When I, when I say I start to cry, like I start to cry uncontrollably. It was, like, it was like someone just pulled the lid and it began to just burst from in here somewhere. I, I, I can't tell you that I actually understand or I understood what I was crying about. I just knew that this was coming out of here somewhere. I wish I could say that I, I, I cried, I had a good cry and got it out, whatever it was, but that wasn't my reality. Once I started crying, I, 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 I'm crying uncontrollably and, and I'm crying, and crying, but once it started... I cried for the next, next 63 days straight, 63 days, some days for three hours at a time, literally until I had no strength left to weep. There'd be days where Georgie had come in and I'd be on the carpet, just on the, on the floor, just crying. And like my, the, the carpet would be literally soaked with my tears. Huh. The same day that I started crying was the day that Georgie and I entered into a furnace together, causing the heat to come upon us and our marriage in ways that I never would have thought was possible, dreamt was possible, or even imagined was possible. Five nights after the crying began, I had the most amazing encounter with God. How many of you know that's what we all need? We need encounters with God. So five, five nights in, and it's like in 3.10 in the morning, it's like I wake up and I know there's a God moment happening in the room somewhere, somehow, and God begins to speak so clearly about what is happening, about elements of what's happening. He begins to speak of the past and, and the decades that have passed, and it brings me right up till now. For 40 minutes, God and I have this encounter. At the end of the encounter, I jump up out of bed, I go get a glass of water, I bring it in, I wake Georgie up. All the women know you love being woken up by your husbands. Amen. All right, so I wake her up in the middle of the night and say, Georgie, I had this encounter with God, and this is what God said, and the first 30 minutes was about me, the last 10 minutes about you. This is what God said, and I'm like, woohoo! Now I'm going to be able to go to sleep and I'm going to wake up tomorrow and be fine. Well, I went back to sleep, woke up the next morning and kept on crying. Just kept on crying. The crying just didn't stop. I just continued to cry. But what made my situation worse now was the fact that the heavens have become brass. I don't know how you dial, yeah, I don't know how you connect with God and the dialect that goes back with and forth, dialogue with God. I don't know how it works for you. I'm in this constant conversation all the time. But then I wake up this next morning and it's like God's gone. His voice is gone. I don't know whether God was gone. I tend to think he probably wasn't, but there was so much noise that I couldn't hear God at all. So five weeks on, the crying just continues on, continues on. I don't know which way is up. I'm not going to work. Obviously, we've made contact with work and the office and church and and they were so kind and so gracious to me. They gave me all the space I needed. Five weeks on, I found myself at a place called Port Macquarie. It's an hour and a half flight north of Melbourne. And so Georgie and I flew up to see Georgie's dad. And I woke up on the Wednesday morning. When I woke up, I woke up crying. How many of you know it's not good when you don't get to have a thought before you're actually crying? I woke up in tears and I'm crying and I'm an emotional and I'm a mess and I, 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 I don't know what to do, and Georgie's still sleeping, and so I, I just pick up the doona, fall onto the floor, literally fall on the floor, crawl off into the, into the bathroom, turn the shower on, and sat there for an hour crying. Just cried and cried and cried, then crawled out, dried myself off, went and sat outside, and then realized the neighbors were watching me cry, so I went back inside and sat on the couch and continued to cry, and by the time I, then it's like three hours from when I woke up and then I go back in and climb back into bed and, and then in that place and it's like, you may be like, you may be like, Shane, why all the crying? Why all the crying? It's a great question. I wish I could just say it was as simple as this, but I, in, in that moment, I don't actually, I didn't know what it was. All as I knew is that I was exhausted like I'd never felt exhaustion. I, I, I felt pain like I'd never experienced a level of pain in my heart. I felt loneliness and rejection like I'd never felt before. The, the truth is, my, my heart and my confidence were shredded, shredded to the point where I didn't even know who I was anymore. I was questioning, I was saying to Georgie, am I ever going to get my life back? Am I ever going to come back because I don't know who this guy is anymore? I, I finally got out of the shower, like I said, and 
went through that and found myself in there with Georgie. <laughs> it was about 10 minutes after Georgie woke up or when I got back in there and we were just there and I was crying and the telephone rang and the telephone had been ringing for the last five weeks but I wasn't talking to anybody. The telephone was ringing and who was it? It's Pastor Mike Kai on the, on the line. I looked at it and I didn't answer it. But Georgie grabbed it, answered it. Hey, Mike. Hey, Georgie. Da, 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 da. And she's like, you know, Shane's not in a good way. And he's like, what? So he jumps on the line. I've got to tell you, I, I'm so thankful. There have been people in this story that I'm, I'm forever grateful for. If you haven't been there, it's really hard to explain and understand. <clears throat> if you have been there and you're no longer there, give God praise. Yeah. Give God praise. <clears throat> you know, Proverbs 17, 17 says, A friend loves at all times and a brother. A brother is born for adversity. So George has got Mike on the line. And through that conversation, the Lord began to rally his angels. How many of you know the Lord has put his angels in charge over you? How many of you know he will rally his angels? And you're like, Shane, you look, just if you're, if you're wondering, these are good tears. I can promise you the others, they were bad. These are good tears. These are tears of gratitude of thankfulness, of appreciation, of love, of future, of destiny, calling. Ha. Ha. Friend loves at all times and a brother is born for adversity. So Georgie answers the phone and we start a conversation. Mike had a number of suggestions, all which proved to be prudent and wise. How many of you know you have a very wise pastor? Amen. Amen. He suggested three things. The first thing was to read uh, Pastor Wayne Cadero's book, Leading on Empty. And I said, I will. Second thing he suggested was to speak to a pastor friend of his that I didn't know, who had a strong prophetic and deliverance ministry, Pastor Mike Connell, which I, I spoke to afterwards. The third thing he encouraged me to do was speak to RG and Annie and tell them specifically what I was going through. Now, I know you don't know who RG and Annie are. RG and Annie are our key intercessors back home. They're our key intercessors. And so I, I, I took note and so I, I downloaded the book. The first thing I did was to download the book. So we travelled home on Thursday and as we travelled, I listened to Wayne Cadero's book. Now, if you're in this state and you're going through, I wouldn't necessarily encourage you to listen to this book on an aeroplane, all right? Because you're probably going to embarrass yourself like I did. Because as I started listening to this book, I got to tell you, it was like I was listening to my story. It's like I got someone telling me what is happening in my life right here, right now. So I hopped on the plane, and for an hour and a half, I got my face pushed up against the window so no one would see me, and I'm crying like a baby, crying like a baby. George is like, is this ever going to stop? You know what I mean? I'm just there, and I'm crying. So I, I cried all the way home, but I realized in that moment, I'm not the only person that's ever gone through what I'm going through right now. Friends, if you're here today and you're experiencing anxiety, depression, sadness, grief, sorrow, pain, whatever it may be, you are not the only person that's ever gone through it. You are not the only person that's ever gone through it. You may be here today and you're thinking nobody will understand. I promise you there are hundreds in this room right now that understand exactly what you're going through because they've either been through it or they're going through it themselves. One of the other friends, I want to encourage you, you are not by yourself in this. You are not there. I listened to Pastor Wayne Cadero and it encouraged me. And at the same time, it brought enlightenment. Then I, I, I reached out. As soon as we landed, I reached out to RG and Annie. I, I texted them and I said, RG and Annie, could we speak on FaceTime tonight? They said, absolutely. absolutely. So we got onto a FaceTime call that went for an hour and a half. When I called RG and Annie, I was caught calling my key intercessors to explain what was going on in my life, to really put it out there. But as I called, I wasn't actually thinking about the fact that these guys are both mental health experts. 
Like when I say experts, I'm not going to tell you what they do, but they're up here. And it's like, they are incre incredible man and woman of God. Also Nigerians. I'm surrounded by Nigerians. Praise the Lord. They're my Nigerian angels. They're awesome. And so I ring them. I ring them. And straight away, any any seems to talk a little bit more than Angie, if you know what I'm saying. She's got the gift of the gab, praise God. And so she says to me straight away, because I'm crying within two minutes, I'm bawling like a baby. And she said, Pastor Shane, I, I had a I had a nightmare with you and a week ago. And I'm like, yeah, when people dream of me, it usually is a nightmare, but let's not go there. <laughs> I said, yeah, and, yeah. And she goes, she goes, I I knew I knew what was happening. So I woke Angie up. In the middle of the night, we got up. I said, Argy, Pastor Shane is under attack. We need to pray for him now. They got up in the middle of the night and they began to intercede. They began to pray in that moment, which I'm once again forever grateful for. All right, so I'm not thinking about the fact that they are mental health experts. They are spiritual and they are wise. They have knowledge and they have understanding. So what do they do? They just go to work. Firstly, from a scriptural position, then from a mental health position. And he reminded me of how Elijah found himself in a cave. Not the man cave, it's another cave, all right. <laughs> After enjoying maybe his most amazing victory in God, Jezebel threatens him and fear and doubt immediately jump onto him and lay hold of him. In 1 Kings chapter 19 from verse 3, it says, Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. Then he went on alone into the desert, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. How many of you know this is not a good day? You're not in a good place. You're not in good shape when you're sitting down and you're praying that you would die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors. And he then went on to speak about Moses, obviously Israel's great deliverer, who brought Israel out of Egypt all the way to the promised land, right to the edge there. Numbers chapter 11 from verse 10 says, Moses heard all the family standing in front of their tents weeping, and the Lord became extremely angry. Moses was also aggravated. All right, all right, so we've got... The congregation is weeping, God is angry, and the pastor is aggravated. Welcome to church, everybody. Praise God. Let's give God praise. All right. Praise God. We're not going to let church. All right. All right. And Moses said to the Lord, why are you treating me, your servant, so miserably? Why, what did I do to deserve the burden of a people like this? Are they my children? Am I their father? Is that why you have told me to carry them in my arms like a nurse carries a baby to the land you swore to give to their ancestors? Where am I supposed to get meat for all these people? They keep complaining and saying, give us meat, give us meat. That's how I do it anyway. Praise God. All right. I, I can't carry all these people by myself. The load is far too heavy. I'd rather you killed me than treat me like this. Please spare me this misery. Friends, can I encourage you today? Be careful what you pray for. Be careful what you pray for. In times like this, just be careful what you pray for. And then we talked about Paul and the constant burden of all the churches and Jesus falling face down to the ground and praying, my father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet I want your will, not mine. But as quickly as they dove into the spiritual realities of what was happening in my life, they then flipped and spoke, uh, spoke about the, spirit, uh, sorry, the physical realities of where I found myself. They then spoke of the very real physiological realities of aging, as if I'm getting older. You know what I'm saying? I said, the hair makes me look younger. Isn't that, that's what you were saying yesterday. Uh, it takes 20 years off, something like that. And so, but how many of you know there are realities of aging? Whether we like it or not, there are realities that go with it. They spoke of the brain, praise God. How many of you, we've all got brains, amen, all right. They spoke of the brain, its fluids, its chemicals, such as serotonin and other uh, realities. They're the realities of aging and ministry and disappointments that somehow or other, I thought if I ignored these realities, they wouldn't apply to me. How many of you know you can ignore whatever you want to ignore, but it's still going to apply to you? There's, there's rules and principles in life and they're woven into us and they are there for all of us to work out. As we concluded, they asked me if I knew someone that might be able to help me professionally. How many of you know when your intercessors are asking you if you know somewhere you can get professional help, you're in trouble? I realized in that moment, I'm in trouble. 
I already knew it, but now I'm hearing it for sure. I said that I wasn't sure, but I said that last week, Dr. Lekin, Dr. Lekin is a psychiatrist that also attends in Joy Church, that is also Nigerian, married to a Nigerian called Dr. Ayo. So these are literally my Nigerian angels. I said Dr. Lekin a week earlier. Okay, so a week earlier is the Thursday night where, where uh, any had a nightmare. They got up and they prayed. The next morning at 8.37 in the morning, Dr. Lekin had rung and left a message, and it's still on my phone to this day, and it says, Pastor Shane, we've been here six years, part of Enjoy Church. We pray for you and Pastor Georgie every morning, but the intensity and the need to pray for you at the moment has got to the point where I do not want to see my first patient today until I hear your voice. That's what he said. That's what he left on the, on the phone. How many of you know God will put his angels in charge over you? He will bring them from everywhere. So at 8.37, that's it. So... This is the night that I would describe, and I have described, as my night of torment. I went through a night on that Thursday night like I could not explain. I'm not going to try to explain it here. You, it, it would do your head in. It's like a Spielberg, Spielberg movie gone wrong. It was like what was going on in the spirit and in the natural and probably in my, in my state of mind. It all wove together to make a very, very bad story. But he insisted that we speak. So after I hopped off the phone, after I spoke to RG Nanny, I then rang Dr. Lekin. It was 10 past nine at night. He says he loves me, but he didn't answer the phone. All right, what does that say? I'm not too sure. But then 10 minutes later, he rang back. So I guess he does love me after all. Praise God. Praise God. And so we had a conversation. It went for an hour. After an hour, he says, Pastor Shane, I need to see you. He said, I'm going to be at a conference tomorrow morning. So he says, I'm going to be there actually all day. But he said, if I was to reach out to the girls now, it's now 20 past 10 at night. If I was to reach out to the girls now and get them to go to the hospital to open up the offices, could you be there by 8.30? I said, absolutely. I got myself there at 8.30. We spoke for an hour and a half. And so began the journey out. I, I, it was, wasn't long after that, two weeks after that, he, he diagnosed me as having severe depression. Severe depression. I would have been happy with depression, but severe. As I, when he said it, to be honest, I got it. I got it. I didn't understand it, though. Like, I'm a fun monkey. You know what I'm saying? This is me. This is not that guy. That guy is sad most of the time. He looks like sucking lemons, if you know what I'm saying. That's not me. I'm an international fun monkey. I'm up and about, living life. Party, party, let's go party. And it's like, how do I, how do I end up with severe depression as an oxymoron. But as we went along and I learned more about myself, physically, emotionally, spiritually, and considered the way I dealt with my disappointments, betrayals, lockdowns, the lockdowns, the lockdowns, as I considered the burden and the weight of ministry that's relentless, the pace that I'd been running and the all-round lack of care that, I, that I'd taken of myself, my question soon turned from how did I end up with depression, because that's what I was asking, to how have I avoided depression and so many other negative mental health realities for so long? Because as I began to understand who I am, the way I'm built, the realities of aging and getting older and the mind and the brain and the chemicals, as I began to understand these things, I questioned how have I been able to avoid it for so long? In Psalm 69, reading from verse 1, it says, Save me, O God, for the floodwaters are up to my neck. Maybe you've come in this morning and you're feeling... I can relate to that if I could be honest, if I could be honest with myself, with my spouse, with my family, with my pastors, leaders, church friends, whatever the case may be. Save me, O oh God, for the floodwaters are up to my neck. Deeper and deeper I sink into the mire. I can't find a foothold to stand on. I am in deep water and the floods overwhelm me. I am exhausted from crying for help. My throat is parched and dry. My eyes are swollen with weeping, waiting for the God to help, for my God to help me. I, I don't know about you. I, I read this in like the first three months of last year. This is my life. This is where I was at. Maybe it's how you've come in this morning, uh, dealing with the realities, trying to work out what it's all about. Disappointment, rejection, deferred hope, lost opportunity, broken relationships, losing loved ones. Losing loved ones in the lockdowns. You know, we, you step outside and you, we're in, a, we're in a lockdown, lockdown, where you get arrested if you're out. 
We were out the front of the house one day and the lady, not next door, but the next door, she runs out like screaming like I've never heard a mama scream. And we're like, we, ran, we just ran down. Like, What's the matter? She's got my, my baby. Her baby is like late 20s. And we go in the room and she's taken her life. And I'm just, I'm like, God. God. You know, when we got back to Australia in 2022, one of our location pastors that had moved on, like, I don't know that we're actually built to be dealing with some things. We loved this couple and they moved on. It was all good and it is all good with him. But she took her life. And I was like, Lord, I understand why people take their life. I never used to. The liar would tell you that if you take your life, the pain will stop. But he's a liar. The pain doesn't stop. It just gets shared to all the people you love. And it doesn't go away. Friends, I'm aware that as I talk today, some things in your lives are going to come to the surface like a flood. Can I encourage you when this happens? Deal with them. Deal with them the right way. Don't just pretend they're not happening. But deal with them. I found myself in this position. I wish I knew how to deal with my disappointment, rejection, deferred hope, lost opportunity, broken relationships, losing loved ones, lockdowns, etc. Unless we're committed to doing the right things when these things arise, all of these things have the potential to cause an erosion of the soul. But if we'll commit to doing the right things, there's great hope for us all. In Joel chapter 2, verse 32, it says here, And it shall come to pass that, that, that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whoever what? Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. There comes a time in all of our lives where we need to raise our hands, where we need to raise our voice, where we need to call upon the name of the Lord. Like our life depends on it, like our future depends on it. Like we, we, we're not going to sit here and take it anymore, but we're going to see the breakthrough. The first thing I needed to do was call upon the Lord. Friends, can I encourage you? Some of you need to hear this today. Start calling upon the name of the Lord. Start calling upon the name of the Lord. You've got to call and call and call and call until your breakthrough comes. Some of you might be like, but I've called before and I'm still in this place. I've called before, I'm still in this place. Friends, there's a way to call. There's a time to call. And now is the time. And I want to show you the way. You just got to lift up your hand and say, Jesus, I need you today. And I want to encourage you. Don't just do this in your prayer closet, but do it with your wife and do it with your husband and do it with your family. Do it with your church. Do it with your pastors. Lord, we need a breakthrough. We need it now. Don't quit. Don't stop. Keep on calling. Keep on calling. For so many of us, if we don't keep on calling, we're, we're going to be overcome by the floodwaters and all will be lost. I knew that if God did not save me, it wasn't just my life that would be going under, but my marriage was going to go under. I, I treated Georgie so poorly. In the, in the last year, I treated her so poorly. My marriage would go under. My family, my ministry, my churches, I knew them. They were all about to be destroyed unless God saved me. There was a day where I sat out the front of my favorite coffee shop, coffee in hand, sitting there contemplating, am I going to drive away and never come back? That was in my thought. There was days I'd drive around the ring road, and to be honest, I was looking at some of those lampposts thinking, it's not a bad option because the pain was so bad, but it's not an option. It's not an option. That's not your future. God is your future. Health is your future. Well-being is your future. Joy is your future. So start calling and don't stop calling. The second thing we need to do is wash. 2 Samuel chapter 12 from verse 19, it says here, when David saw that his servants were whispering, David perceived that the, the child was dead. Therefore, David said to his servants, is the child dead? 
And they said, he is dead. So David arose from the ground, washed and anointed himself and changed his clothes. And he went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he went to his own house. And when he requested, they set food before him and he ate. Then his servants said to him, what is this that you have done? You fasted and you wept for the child while he was alive. But when the child died, you arose and ate food. And he said, while the child was alive, I fasted and wept for, for I said, who can tell whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. For whatever reason, I found myself with depression, but not for a minute did I entertain the thought or the idea of making depression my close friend or a close companion. Not for a minute. No, no, no. As soon as I discovered the reality of my mental condition, I was committed to washing it off, to anointing myself, to dressing up, to worshipping, to strengthening myself and getting ready for a better tomorrow. You've got to make a choice. Are you going to make peace with this thing or war with this thing? Friends, I want to encourage you. Call upon the name of the Lord. Wash it off. Wash it off. Uh, wash it off. The truth, I said over and over and over again to Georgie, I want my life back. Some of you need to get desperate. I want my life back. This thing was stealing, robbing, killing me. I wanted my life back. So I committed myself to the word, to prayer, to being accountable to the right people, to exercise the spiritual and psychiatric care. Ecclesiastes 9 verse 4 says, there is hope only for the living. Are you alive today? Yes. Praise God, there is hope in this room for you today. There is, for, as they say, it is better to be a live dog than a dead lion. Praise God, this old dog's still alive and I'm not quitting. I'm not quitting, I'm going to keep on going. I want my life back. I had to commit to washing certain things off, things like doubt, fear, unforgiveness, while at the same time commit to putting certain things on, things like faith, hope and love. All right, thirdly, final thought, here we go. I had to keep walking. Everyone say, keep walking. I had to keep walking. In Psalm chapter 23, from verse 4, it says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, even though I walk through the valley of the... I can't do that. I wish I could rap. I wish I, wish I was Mike Kai. Everyone wishes I was Mike Kai. But anyway, you can rap, right? You can rap. Ba -bop, ba -bop, ba -bop. You got a little, little tushy out there. It's like, boop, boop. Like, you got to go... Forgive me, I'm on medication. <laughs> Moving right along. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. So I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So as I stand here today, I can promise you this. I thank God that I'm not where I was 18 months ago. But truthfully, if we can be honest, because we're in church, let's be truthful, honest. Neither am I completely where I think I want to be. Neither am I completely where I want to be. So what will I do each day? What am I going to do? I'm going to continue to call upon the name of the Lord. And there are some days where I need to call louder and more often. I, I, I'm going to continue to get up each day and wash off what I need to wash off and clothe myself with what I need to put on. And I'm going to keep on walking. This valley of death, it's not going to turn into my graveyard. No, 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 no. Why? Because I'm going to step out of this place. I'm going to keep on walking. I'm going to keep on going. I'm going to join with my brothers and join with my sisters. But my question to you today, my brothers and my sisters, my friends, is what about you? What about you? Now, you know and I know that typically pastors aren't going to go here like I've gone here today. We're not going to do it. For a million different reasons, we're not going to do it. My psychiatrist, Dr. Lekin, said the night before I shared this at church, Are you sure you want to do this? And I'm like, heck yeah, I do. I want the devil to pay. I want to see people set free. I want to see people set free. You and I know we're, 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 we've got no problem with dealing this stuff behind closed doors, right back there somewhere, but not in public. Because what will people think? I don't know. What will people think? This has been my experience. All as I've heard, from our people is thank you. 
Thank you for being honest. Thank you for taking the time out you needed to. Thank you for being real with us. Thank you for allowing us to put up our hands and say, we need help. We all need help at times. Either you've been there, you are there, or you know someone that is there. And it's actually okay. You don't think God knows? God knows it all. And he put you in a family that's going to love you and care for you and walk with you. I don't know what your natural family's like. Some of my natural family said dumb things to me when they found out. My spiritual family, they were awesome. They held me up, they cared for me, they loved me, they walked with me, they journeyed with me. So I ask you today, what about you? What will you do? You've heard what I've done. What will you do? Today I want to pray for a number of people. I want to pray for those that may be suffering from depression, anxiety, stress, sadness, grief. You say sadness? Is that a sickness? When you're sad all the time, it's a sickness. Jesus didn't die on the cross that you would be sad all your life, but that you'd have joy. So I'm going to ask all around this auditorium that if you be struggling, you be challenged in the realms of depression, anxiety, stress, sadness, or grief, or you be challenged because in your life you have someone that's going through all of that, because I know, there's one thing I do know, I went through what I went through, then I put it on Georgie as well, as she tried to care for me. So I'm going to ask every person that's struggling with depression, anxiety, stress, sadness, grief, or you're a carer of someone that is, I'm simply going to ask you to stand to your feet right now, wherever you are, just stand up. And I know it's going to take courage, it's going to take boldness. Come on, let's give them a hand as they stand, wherever they're standing right now. Just stand to your feet, stand to your feet. We're going to pray. 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 We're going to call upon the name of the Lord. Now, I know you know, we all know how this works. We're all here. But there's some other people and you're, you're still battling in your mind as to whether, what will, can I encourage you, if you want to be included in the prayer, just stand up right now. Just stand. Don't wait. Don't wait. Don't be concerned about what people think. The only thinking that's going to be happening in this room is our hearts will go out to you. Our hearts will go out to you, just like the Lord's heart has gone out to you. Today, we're going to pray. Brothers and sisters, I want to encourage you to get ready to receive something from God right now. Just position yourself. Open your hands. Open your arms. Open, open yourself up to receive from the Holy Spirit. If you're a leader in the church, I want to encourage you. Just put your arm, put your hand out towards those. Put your arm on those that are standing around you, that are in pain, that are suffering, that are grieving, that have got anxiety, got depression, whatever the case may be. Father, we call upon the one who can save us. Lord, we call upon your name. Jesus, we call upon your name. You are our deliverer. You are our salvation. You are our everything. Lord, without you, we do not have breath, but in you, we have all that we need. So we call upon the name of the Lord. And I pray, Almighty God, as my brothers and sisters have stood to their feet today as they acknowledge, Lord God, within the body of Christ, I'm struggling in these areas. Lord, I pray by the power of your spirit, you would break, Lord God, the spirit of depression, the spirit of anxiety, spirit of stress, sadness and grief. Lord, we pray, Lord, for every carer. We pray, Lord, for every man, for every woman in this place that has their hands raised to you. We pray, Almighty God, that they would begin a journey today. They would begin a journey that leads, Lord, to their recovery and to full health in Jesus' name. I pray, Almighty God, that we together would call upon your name. We would wash off those things and we would put on those things. And Lord, we would walk out of here. Lord, I thank you today that you are the one who will come. You will walk with us. You will talk with us. You will show us your ways and you'll lead us out of this valley of death, Lord God, into the glorious life you've got for us. So Lord, I speak, Lord God, into every heart. Joy, 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 joy. Lord, I speak, Lord, glorious and inexpressible joy. I declare, Lord God, you are our salvation. 
You are our help in time of need. And this day, we will give you a thank offering, Lord, for the deliverance that's about to come now in Jesus' name. Come on, church. Why don't we give up a mighty shout of praise, of gratitude, of thanks for what the Lord is doing in Jesus' name. God bless you.